So, in the in the last lecture, we ended it uh, after covering the neuroanatomy, and to the very grossly telling you about how the brain functions. We move on to looking, taking a slightly deeper look at how the brain functions. As I said at the end of the last lecture, it's the electrochemical activity in the brain which generates behavior by working in the various specialized areas of brain, the firing between 10 to the power 11 neurons, which are connected in columns and in the form of functional cell assembly. So, just look at, we will try to look at how actually it happens in the brain, but before that few names are important. One people who discovered this functioning. One is Galvani, who discovered the natural electrical activity in the nervous system, which led to the measurement of brain activity. Muller, who actually defined this five kinds of nerves, visual, auditory, and but it was and the doctrine of specific nerve energies. He was actually telling that nerves are specialized in passing information. But it was Helmholtz who actually gave the speed of the nervous impulse the electricity which passes through the axon. He also gave the trichromatic theory of vision, the difference between sensation and perception, audition, I mean he actually contributed a lot to understanding of the electrical activities in the brain. And as I told you last time that it is the neurotransmitters which actually pass the information from one neuron to the other. And as you would remember, it is not one neuron which is passing to one neuron, it is an ensemble of neuron, cell assem neuronal assemblies which pass information from one group to the other, irrespective of where they are situated. So, one of these is acetylcholine, acetylcholine is uh, this is just how it is formulated and acetylcholine has its receptors on the cell body and dendrites. We will bypass this how it is so these neurotransmitters are being made in the specialized cell body and the neurons and once they pass from the axon to the dendrite of the other neuron they either excite it or inhibit it. These are important because this is on the basis of this discovery of this neurotransmitter, their levels and their receptors, the drugs have been made, which can alter their level in the brain, in the form of tablets or injections, and then in turn altering the behavior. So, these neurotransmitters actually regulate the electro electrical firing, which in turns leads to normal behavior or abnormal behavior, alteration of which through external chemicals can impact illnesses. So, one is acetylcholine, the other is monoaminergic, which regulates sleep and arousal and hunger and mood. Amino acids like excitatory amino acids like glutamate, inhibitory like GABA, gamma amino butyric acid. So, NMDA receptors, this is just to show you how it functions. This is one of the glutamate receptors and these are the sites where glutamate can bind. Depending on the binding of glutamate, this may open and as I said, it can allow sodium to flow in or to depolarize or to polarize. It can increase the positivity outside, but glutamates are excitatory. So, they will always lead to a reversal of polarization on setting a current. This is one of the slides which shows you that sodium channels open, it leads to depolarization here. Calcium channel opens, this calcium enters when magnesium is removed and leads to repolarization. So, this is the process depolarization and repolarization through which the firing is controlled. So, this is a GABA receptor. There are other receptors which 
serves as hormone substance P gut hormones like angiotensin, neuropeptide Y releasing factor for hormones. So, this is just a list of all the type of uh, chemicals, there are many more which are being in the process of being discovered. These chemicals are spread all through the body, but we are focusing here on. So, these are neuroactive opioids. If you, if you look at opioids, which uh, also form some drugs of abuse like morphine and heroin, they are naturally present in the human brain, controlling what we call reward systems, like endorphins also do it. The reward system is an area of a brain, where if you do a certain activity, that brain area feels pleasure in that and you feel a sensation of sensation of being of feeling good and that is why the brain has this tendency of repeating that action which makes you feel good that is the whole pursuit of happiness sometimes some people if you you all must be knowing of this term called addiction this is one of the basis of addiction that somebody uses some chemical has a good feeling and tends to use it again till he keeps using it till a point where that same amount of chemical stops giving that pleasurable feeling and that is the basis of what you call tolerance when people increase the amount of the drug which they are using drug or alcohol it's also a basis of habit formation whatever you feel good you tend to keep doing again the basis of it is feeling good inside in this reward system so this is what i've already mentioned acetylcholine dopamine norepinephrine serotonin histamine gaba nitric oxide these are diffusible gases we'll just skip this details they actually regulate uh, the blood flow in the brain and periphery especially this nitric oxide is the basis of this common drug called viagra where it controls the blood flow in the penis so this is a small summary so now once this these chemicals are secreted they are caught onto the neuroreceptors depending on their specialization and their function they either excite or inhibit but then what starts at the cell body is the basis of all electricity in the brain and that is called the action potential it is a rapid depolarization of the membrane depolarization as you know is the reversal of the positivity which normally in a polarized state is positive outside the cell membrane and negative inside is a rapid depolarization it is starts at the exon hillock and passes quickly along the exon at the end of the cell body it starts it is quickly repolarized to allow subsequent firing so once this wave of depolarization passes from one small area to the adjoining area the previous area is repolarized to allow the further signal processing so this post synaptic potentials are small an individual neuron as i said will not produce enough depolarization similarly the inhibitory post synaptic will counter the effect of excitatory so as as i told you there are multiple if you look at this the multiple neurons descend on a dendrite or a body of the neuron called exon hillock where the exon is starting and all these inputs whether they are excitatory post synaptic potentials post synaptic is this pre synaptic is before the gap if they are excitatory or inhibitory some of them may be excitatory some of them may be inhibitory so there is a summation which goes on summation can be spatial or temporal spatial means that if you take a small area and the number of neurons which are descending on it so the epsp and ipsp counter each other and whatever the net result is will decide whether it's going to fire or not or they may be temporal maybe there are few neurons and in a sequence the signal is coming from the top and depending on the speed and the the inhibition or excitation which they cause that can also be submitted so but if there is sufficient depolarization which starts here action potential will be triggered which will be, be passing on to the other neurons it's like here you can see it eventually th this is a muscle fiber so even when you have to move your muscle actually the nerves which 
exit the spinal cord and go and end on the muscles, they will secrete chemicals which will decide whether the muscle fiber is going to contract or not. So, that is broadly how the neurons function, but if this is where we talk of one or two neurons, but when we look at the ensemble of neurons and when they get together and as I said they form functional assemblies and they also form the specialized areas, all this range of human behavior comes. This is just a broad thing to show you whether how the left brain and the right brain function. It is not an exact division, but largely some functions have been associated with the left brain logic and analytical, strategic, practical, controlling. These functions of our behavior are largely controlled by the left brain, whereas the right brain is more freedom, passion, creative. Right brain has a tendency to look over the overall picture, whereas the left is more sequential and linear. Now, this is very important sentence. There is no more important quest in the whole of science than the attempt to understand very events in evolution by which brain worked out that special trick that enabled them to add to the scheme of things color, sound, pain, pleasure and all the facets. They are essentially saying that in the evolution, the brain gained these functions and to make us fit with all the possible sensations and mental experiences. Sperry was the person who studied the split brain, when the corpus callosum is damaged and the two brains function uh, separately and you will be surprised to know that they seem to have their own existence. What the left brain may see, the right brain may not see, especially in this brain damaged patients, where the left and brain function, the corpus callosum is gone. So, the left brain may say, if you ask a question what do you want to be, the left brain may give another answer and the right brain may have another idea about your life. At the end of the day, it is they have to combine and integrate to make a composite whole. Again just to reiterate what I was telling you. So, you receive the signal here, which is a reception, it is integration that is the summation which goes and then it passes on, the signal is encoded, there is the output and which fires the other neurons. Again the same somatosensory, visual and this is how neurons are arranged in different uh, layers. So, excitatory is this, inhibitory this is increased and decreased. So, if it goes on like this, like exon comes, puts a chemical here, it is may be excitatory, the other one comes which may be inhibitory, so these two will be summated and the net product will be passed down. It is important to understand this electrochemical range of behavior, because this is where the drug treatment or the pharmacology works. If you put it in a network form and you can just have a patience to just look at this, these may be these are the neurons and this may be inhibitory connection, this may be excitatory, this is how neurons are connected, there are just few of them, take it to a scale of 10 to the power 11. Not all neurons are connected to each other, but each neuron is connected to the other by maximum of 2 to 3 synapses. So, between one neuron to another it may be at a different di uh, distance in a different geographical location, still there will be 2 or 3 intervening neurons, which will actually connect them through excitatory and inhibitory connections. And so, it is not a linear thing in the sense, in linear things suppose there is a signal and it goes on achieves its effect say for a muscle movement, but there has to be a feedback connection. The feedback connection unless it is brought back to the brain, you can see it, this is the basis, this is a stimulus, it goes to the brain and we act on this, but there has to be a feedback connection to the brain, otherwise the brain will not know what to do the next moment. And one of the important functions of the way human brain has evolved is anticipation and prediction, because if we do not anticipate and predict what is going to happen we may not be able to really survive in this world. So, this is again the way it moves through the cortex. So, how do we live? We live like this, this is the environment, the sensation goes as we have discussed primary sensory, there is a association here, there is a there is a polymodal from various modalities, like this may be a primary sensation of touch, but while it reaches here, this touch may be integrated with vision, with the sound with smell, then it goes to the prefrontal cortex, 
which decides, decides on what to do, it comes down, it goes to the motor area through the spinal cord, through the primary motor and it comes down to act on it. So, this is called a stimulus response cycle. Now, if there is a threat or if there is a stimuli which can harm you or damage your brain actually bypasses the whole thing reaching your consciousness. If as I said in the last lecture, if you suddenly there is a pin prick, you will remove your hand even before you are conscious of it. So, this whole process of from the unconscious to conscious takes some time from a stimulus which comes to your eye or body, it takes about 200 to 500 milliseconds for it to reach your conscious level. It will not reach before that. So, lot of reflex actions are done within that 100 millisecond period, because if suppose you wait for your to decide whether you want to remove your hand from the pin prick, it may actually hurt you. So, the brain in evolution in an attempt to save itself from the predators and all the dangers of animals and nature, it actually devised this reflex action which just happens within 100 millisecond and you are saved. So, for one to survive the reflex action and your brain must be functioning fine. Now, what you have to decide reaches your brain say in 200 to 500 milliseconds on which the brain can consciously take a decision of acting or not acting. That means simply that lot of your processes in the brain are happening in the unconscious way. In fact, almost 90 percent. So, when we study psychology, Freud was the one who was saying that a lot of it is unconscious. He may be proven right with coming research. It is only 10 to 15 percent what reaches your conscious brain and that too is decided by how your, your unconscious mind has decided to make a composite image. So, your unconscious brain through integration of all the various sensations which are going in the body, in the mind, comparing it with the existing memory and map, also taking an emotional decision on it, the limbic system decides in the hierarchy of threatful stimuli, the limbic system decides whether it is pleasurable, whether it is good or it is threatful. Depending on that, it takes a composite set of information given to the and also on the salience of the stimulus which is presented to you it is given to your frontal cortex or the cingulate gyrus, which are the areas of uh, central executive network and salience network to decide on what action to take, whether you are going to act on it or whether you are going to emote on it or think about it. So, unconscious still is powerful. Now, at a given point of time, there are so many stimuli going on. So, the brain unites all that to give you a singular sense of unity, which gives you a sense of what are you, what is me. So, when I am saying what is me or when you are saying what is you, it is taking in all the information in the environment, putting it into a singular unity and that create and creating a sensation of I. It, so, when you look at I, it is not one thing and if you go down there, you will actually boil down to thousands of sensations and thousands of different type of electrical firing. This is the type of electrical firing which create different type of electrical activity in the brain, which we will talk when we talk of investigating in, into the brain. And, and, and this goes on, this goes on through your lifetime. So, imagine the complexity of the task which brain is managing it at every given instance. Now, this is just one of the pictures if you look at it. So, what do you see? You look at the cube and you look at the black and white picture. Different people see different things. Now, this is happening unconsciously. Your brain is really creating, the brain is also in the process become very smart. Even if you give half information to it and if it really has a previous information about it or some memory or map, it tries to fill in. It, that is later on we talk about gestalt it tries to fill in those gaps and again tries to give you a composite image. So, this is what is happening. There is an encoding in the brain, there is an interference with various other sensations. This is how memory is formed. There is a reverberation, reverberation means the same circuits keep firing again and again. And as they keep firing, the whole signal is amplified and is stored. This is stored by changing the synapses, the synapses are strengthened. So, when you tend to forget, like you 
talk to somebody and you forget what did you talk, it is possibly that your attention span in the brain was not enough to keep those set of neurons firing which were remembering that. So, attention actually is a bottleneck, the bottleneck is attention has so many inputs right from outside, from your internal body, from your internal memory, from your emotional state, from your priority, lot of things are going and attention has to filter some of them, pay attention to some of them, these things at a given point of time and depending on that, which obviously has some amount of intent and will, your brain will process that. So, if a brain, if your attention is not on something and that you tend to forget that later on, the mechanism is that because the brain had decided not to pay attention to it. So, the inner circuit where things would have been remembered were not firing repeatedly on, on that issue. So, may and because it did not change the synapses, that is why you do not tend to remember and that is how memory is. So, lot of memory is divided on procedural memory, which is how you move your body and all, which is into the cerebellum and basal ganglia. There is a lot of declarative memory, which is episodic, which is maybe concerning your life or, or and there semantic, which has there may be meaning in some event or some act, which is stored in the form of a meaning. So, memory is formed depending on the emotional weightage given to a certain event. Now, people may say that you may be rational and you thinking, but the, the emotional mind actually gives weightage to the hierarchy and the relevance and that is why we tend to forget things which we do not like. Remembering lot of things which you do not like often becomes the source of other problems. So, again like there are items here represented in the brain, there is a hidden process going on and these are all the categories of things of action and things which you know. Right. So, connection between these and these is formed in the unconscious brain. So, brain may not explicitly tell you how it is forming the connection, but the neural arrays will always form a connection. So, that if you say sing, you can really come back to this one of these living things with which you can connect. Like in your personal memory, uh, in your personal memory bank, if you look at you may recognize your grandmother, but is it the same set of neurons which are recognizing grandmother and are recognizing some film celebrity or are they different? What is the emotional content to each of it? All that is determining on what you realize that you know. So, we use a functional framework to organize a good deal of cognitive neuroscience, but we do not know everything we really do not know lot of stuff in fact, but we know lot of it peripherally also, but which, which are being used to uh, at least create some brain computer interfaces and lot of it comes from psychology. So, once again to crossly look at it, there is a sensory input, there is a attentional capture, vision, hearing, there are sensory buffers, right, our eyes and our ears and so, there is a top down voluntary attention, but the mind actually decides on which one to pay attention to. So, it goes to the central exec from central ex executive, it goes to working storage, verbal rehearsals. So, we know memory is immediate, short term and long term, immediate is immediate in seconds, short term is like we are rehearse, the mind is rehearsing and once it goes to long term storage it is stored in the form of autobiographical memory, linguistic, semantic, habit, motor skill, but central executive once it receives all this data, it will decide on action planning or response output or it may send to verbal rehearsal and visual spatial sketch pad. So, visual areas this is just a while watching a movie, see, see the activities in the left hemisphere all this, this is another network. So, across species you can compare because the areas of the brain are the same, we have not developed any new area in the brain over evolution. This is a activation map, hippocampal places depending on what task which we give, we will talk about this in the while we are talking about imaging. These are the areas which get activated depending on the task which we give 
and the, this is a source of illness also because once there is a fear which goes into the brain is a sensory cortex receives it hippocampus the area where all this short term memory and reverberative firing is going on once this area receives and remembers it as a, as a fearful stimulus and passing on to thalamus thalamus also announces it this will be stored so every time you see this animal your mind will trigger the same fear response which it has come to classical conditioning you remember pavlov the, he used this he did not know the biology but he knew the psychology of it if you remember the famous dog experiment so emotions are also normal papet circuit is the circuit in the limbic system which actually is the emotional circuit and lot of activity on this decides on what stimulus what memory what action we are going to pay attention and what is important for us these are the structure neocortex cingulate gyrus anterior nucleus hypothalamus you remember finest gauge this is the so there was a damage to his orbital frontal cortex and later on we found a impaired social and sexual behavior in him that was the first sign that the, there are areas of brain which control behavior we still know that the damage to cortex on various areas can lead to different type of behavior imagine this now we have, we have found out that in psychiatric illnesses different areas of brain though, although we are not totally sure but lot of information indicates that in frontal area or deep in the brain in limbic system can really affect emotions again about the parallel circuits in dementia the illness where there is a progressive decline in memory intelligence and uh, personality you can see the difference in the brain there is a there is almost like a shrinking of the brain mostly in hippocampal area where there is a damage to memory and this is what i was telling you about the long term potential once there is a long term potentiation and the brain firing has gone beyond a certain time frame there is a synaptic alteration and that you don't tend to for, forget that's why in dementia is the recent memory where the memory is being formed in hippocampus and uh, limbic system in papet circuit the damage to those neurons really leads to deficit in short term memory first and long term memories are last to go so these are type of before learning and after learning more transmitter release excitatory post synaptic potential larger pre and post synaptic areas and this is the new synapses formation this is memory formation really we'll come to the eeg waves and all that later on as i said semantic and episodic memory language we've already talked this conduction between the wernicke's area where you receive the words and where you create the words this is a sort of we can talk about it when we come to talking about illnesses so speech as i said we have told you hearing words and creating there is a whole network which works there uh we'll skip all this just let me give you an example of dyslexia dyslexia is a illness in children we'll talk about it this is just a disruption in the brain areas and the connectivity between them so we'll stop at this i think we got a broad idea of how the brain works through networks and connections and in the next lecture we'll talk about how do we actually look at it that is the imaging the brain thank you